Hello and welcome to the Evolution of Medicine news video cast. It is Saturday, the 14th of May, and we are back for another week. This week's news video cast is brought to you by the Whole Health Medicine Institute. And um, you can find out a lot more about the program. We're actually going to talk about it today because we have the founder of the Whole Health Medicine Institute as our special guest. So a warm welcome to my partner, as ever, Gabe Hoffman on the line, and also Dr. Lissa Rankin. Welcome, Dr. Uh, hi, please call me Lissa. <laughs> so Lissa, um, you know, we're going to talk about, we're going to focus on one story this week, and that's the story of, um, it's been all over the news. We've got it here in the British Medical Journal, we've got it here um, in the, on the Huffington Post, but it's literally been reported anywhere, everywhere, is that uh, on May 3rd, the same day, and they say this is, our, this is in the Huffington Post, the same day that Donald Trump became the presumptive Re Republican nominee, a breakthrough article was published in the BMJ entitled Medical Area error, the third leading cause of death in the U.S. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, when I was looking at this and I was looking at all the reporting, I had an opportunity to look at uh, your Facebook page. Now, a couple of years ago, I wrote an article for the Huffington Post and I tried to quote this number because it's something that's talked about in integrated medicine uh, circles, but there wasn't sort of an official, it wasn't official now, and now I guess it's official. And, um, you know, I'd love for you to just share your perspective on, uh, you know, on, on this, you know, incredible statistic for our audience. Well, first of all, I think it's interesting, the whole concept of official or not official. I, I actually quoted this statistic three years ago in a TEDx talk that I gave. So it's not a new statistic, but all of a sudden it's all over the news because, you know, a reputable medical journal has now confirmed what has been already out there in, in the data for many years. You know, and the reason that I think it's uh, coming across as new data is because, you know, when, when the CDC publishes the leading causes of death, it's based on ICD-9 codes. Uh, so, for example, if somebody has a, you know, a, a death as the result of a medical error, there is no ICD-9 code for that currently. And so it'll be listed as whatever the physiological cause of death that was the result of the medical error is. And so that's it's sort of gone under the radar and I think, you know, I think it's a very disturbing statistic, not just for patients, but for doctors. And I think already, you know, the, the medical community feels terribly helpless and sometimes hopeless when it comes to the way things are inside of the system. And I was recently in a circle of doctors. I run a training program for doctors and I work a lot with doctors, so I have the opportunity to really be in sort of heart-centered, open, honest dialogue with doctors about some of these kinds of topics. And the topic that we were discussing was trust. And for some reason, this was, this was a very sensitive and painful conversation to talk to doctors about trust. And we were trying to get at the root of like, what is so painful about <laughs> the idea of trust and what came out of it was what the, is that the doctors were saying that they were called to medicine as a sort of spiritual calling, the way a priest is called to the priesthood. And they wanted to be somebody that patients could trust in times of greatest vulnerability, that they would be this sacred space of healing. And yet, by colluding with an untrustworthy system, they themselves had become untrustworthy. And that was so painful that it was erupting a lot of really uncomfortable emotions for the doctors in this group. And I think when a statistic like this comes out, it, it sticks needles in that core wound that a lot of doctors are walking around with of like, am I participating with an untrustworthy system? It, you know, here I am to save lives and by participating in a system, am I being, am I being part of the third leading cause of death? I think that's a, you know, it's such an interesting uh, point and you, it sounds like such an amazing dialogue that you started with the doctors. I mean, you hear people and this is what we know about our audience uh, and, and it's true not just of the functional doctor, but I think most doctors who get into this field want to, are, their intentions are to be a healing and, and, and a place, like you said, of trust and what you described and to imagine, you know, going through working so hard to become a doctor, to go through medical school, to be that, and now be instead being called the third and, and being a part of a system that is the third leading cause of death in the U.S., that's incredibly painful and traumatic, I would think. 
Well, and I think the other thing that gets triggered is that there's already, you know, medical error is already part of the dialogue inside of the system. And the powers that be um, tend to have the impulse to say, okay, there's error happening, therefore we need more bureaucracy, more paperwork, more computer forms, more control. And of, of course, that's not the solution. More control and more bureaucracy is, an, is not the solution because I think part of the reason that medical error is the third leading cause of death in this country is because everybody inside of the system is overtaxed. I mean, I'm, I'm not inside the system anymore, but when I was, I was expected to see 40 patients a day. How am I not going to make an error when I'm seeing 40 patients and I've got seven and a half minutes to deal with, you know, sometimes life-threatening <laughs> issues in seven and a half minutes? And I'm dependent upon other people in a system to then implement my orders. And the breakdown, I really believe that a lot of the root cause of this disturbing statistic is the breakdown of the doctor-patient relationship. If the patient is somebody that I have a long-term relationship with, and we have a real heart-centered connection, and this is, you know, I am practicing as a true healer, and this person is part of my consciousness, then, as, as we all are part of each other's consciousness, then the likelihood that there's going to be a breakdown that I'm going to miss is going to be lower. But if, you know, when I was seeing 40 patients a day, I couldn't even tell you the name of a patient that I saw an hour ago. I mean, I was just so overtaxed and doing the very best that I could and really with good intentions. I was not a bad person or a bad doctor. And yet error is going to be inevitable in that sort of situation. And if you start adding more paperwork and more control, more people at the top inside of the administrative systems that are now trying to reduce medical error by adding yet, an, yet another system of bureaucracy to the, the plate without reducing the number of patients that a doctor is expected to see, for example, you know, that's going to make it worse, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Gabe, you know, it's, uh, this has been a conversation, it seems like we've been having, you know, all the way through the evolution of medicine is like, how do you create a structure where a integrated medicine or functional medicine doctor can live the kind of life that they're recommending to their patients? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, more and more, and, and the doctor, it, and especially in this situation, is left holding the bag for this system that's been developed, it's almost turning medicine and office visits, if you're seeing 40 people in a day, I mean, it's, it almost becomes a commodity. And what we've talked about too, is now we have all these city MDs and walk-in clinics, and it's such a breakdown of, of just what you said, the patient doctor relationship. And that's one of the big focuses of our content and what we work with our community on. Um, you know, our, the purpose of, of what James and I are doing is to empower doctors, not just so they can have successful practices that are scalable, but so they can live happy lifestyles, so they can be healthy, happy people and, and really provide what they got into this for in the first place. And it's a very different model to be able to do that. You, ch you have to change the way the, the efficiency is. Uh, you, know, you have to change so much about medicine if you look at the fact that you know, what Lisa's saying is they she's seeing 40 people a day. I mean, it's just not possible to create that. And ultimately, when we have empowered doctors who are helping people in the way they, they know that they can and that they got into this for, who are also leading a lifestyle that allows them to take care of themselves, other doctors are going to look at that and say, hey, I want to do that. I want to practice medicine that way. And I think that's been our intention from the beginning. Absolutely. Well, you know, I think the challenge with that, I mean, I, when I left the system, I, I started an integrative medicine practice and I was seeing seven patients a day. But the problem then is it was a cash-based system and people were paying out of pocket and I was just kind of billing, you know, giving them a super bill and they could give it to their insurance. Um, so it then limits that kind of care to the elite. I was working in Marin County where I have a very wealthy population and they were able to pay to spend an hour a day with me. So certainly that is going to reduce the incidence of medical error inside that population, but it's not going to, it's not going to affect, you know, the mainstream medical system, which as physicians, you know, it's, I think that it, it's, 
it's not enough to just say, oh, well, let's leave the system and work with the elite. <laughs> we also have to, you know, we are, we are the system. We are the leaders. We are, it is, I think, our responsibility not to kind of be in this victim mentality of, you know, oh, the, the evil corrupt system and, and we're going to just leave it and not participate. You know, that, to be able to actually rise up as empowered leaders and use our influence in order to heal the system from the grassroots level. And I really do think it's grassroots. I don't think it's more bureaucracy, more policy. I think those things are important. But I think when we start to really reclaim, when we really start to stand up as healthcare providers and as patients, to say we're going to reclaim the sacred relationship that lies at the heart of medicine and we're going to do it with or without the system and we'll figure, you know, we don't know the solution. And I think this is part of, part of the problem and part of the reason that doctors feel so helpless is we don't know what to do. And so we have to be willing to, to inhabit, you know, what Charles Eisenstein calls the space between stories. And we are in the space between stories in medicine and these kinds of statistics just confirm that the old story of medicine is, is dying. No, but it's not working for anybody. Nobody trusts it anymore. I, I certainly don't. And most of the patients and physicians or, and even hospital CEOs that I know don't really trust the system either. It's not working the way it did when my dad was a doctor 40 years ago. And so we, you know, as we inhabit that unknown, uncertain space between stories where one story has ended and another story has not yet begun. I think really this is just an opportunity for all of us to drop into the heart and to come into community together to be open to that, you know, quantum field of infinite possibility where we can start to envision a new future and create it together. And I so appreciate what you all are doing here with your community to be part of that reimagining of the future of medicine. Absolutely. Well, thank you for saying that. Listen, you know, we've, you know, we've, we've been, uh, you know, working out for a long time. What are some of these, you know, new structures that, that can create something that really works for everyone? Because we completely agree, you know, as long as integrated medicine is only for, and I'll quote my friend, Dr. Robin Burson on this, the, the very green, the very rich and the very, you know, and the very desperate, you know, we, we can, we're not going to solve uh, medicine in any way, shape or form. And I do see like the grassroots or the green shoots, if you will, of uh, new structures and things like you know group visits and, and some of the technologies that can allow us to sort of scale care but with you know with the the relationship at the center of it and the power of community and peer-to-peer support but you know we don't know what the answer is right now but we're working it out as we go along and that's part of this sort of hero's journey that all of these physicians are on is, is to you know to work it out you know it's interesting you said about the ICD-9 and 10 codes earlier because Gabe and I were just joking that you know we had Dr. David Perlmutter on last uh, last month on the forum and he talked about these insane ICD-10 codes like uh, hit by a duck initial encounter <laughs> or, you know, burned your feet water skiing initial encounter. Like <laughs> those insane things that are real, real ICD-10 codes. And yet, you know, we don't have one for medical errors. So I think that just shows, um, you know, how, how um, you know, how insane the, the system is. But um, this, I'd love for you to share just a little bit of, um, you know, sort of how you're taking doctors on the space between stories as part of your whole health medicine institute, because I know that there's a subsection of doctors that the approach that you're taking taking is resonating with and um you know we're excited to you know to connect people to the right resources they need to go on their own hero's journey and um you know i'd love for you to just share just like sort of like the baseline of of what you've seen to really be uh valuable for doctors who are stuck between stories well you know i we have two two programs that are going on this year one is the whole health medicine institute which actually begins a week from thursday uh, which is starting with a four-day live event in San Diego with me and Kitchen Table Wisdom author and physician, Rachel Naomi Remen. And it's a, a four-month program for doctors and, uh, and other healthcare providers. And it really focuses, it's not about integrative or functional medicine per se. It really focuses pretty exclusively on what I'm calling sacred medicine or the psycho-spiritual kind of psychoneuroimmunology elements of, you know, based on, on valid scientific data of what we as providers can do to facilitate the body's natural self-healing mechanisms. And a lot of that is, revolves around, 
you know, limiting belief, community and support, trusting your intuition, diagnosing the root cause of illness, um, you know, learning how as a patient and as a provider how to use those intuitively guided knowings about what is aligned for your own health care to write what we call the prescription for yourself, which is based on sort of the philosophy you know, if one of the two common questions that I would ask patients when I was still in practice was, what is your body saying no to, and what does your body need in order to heal? And those two questions can be really illuminating, even if, we, even if you only have 10 minutes with a patient. Sometimes their own intuition can pop up with, oh, my God, I need, I need to quit my job, or I need to get out of this toxic relationship, or it's time for me to finally you know, follow my dream and go to art school, or I need to put my mother in a nursing home because this, you know, the, the burden of this is putting me in stress response all the time. And it's really based on that idea that the body is equipped with natural self-healing mechanisms that only operate when the nervous system is in relaxation response. So what can we as providers do not only to be part of that relaxation response inducing process for the patient, which is part of what I think is the placebo effect. We are, as healers, we are the placebo. That's, that's, we're part of it. And, but also to, um, to really help people get to the root of what their illness might be trying to communicate with them so that illness becomes a portal to awakening. Absolutely. We also have, we also have a, a, a open to the public program this year, the Whole Health Summit. And I'm really excited about that because we're really looking to bring together the people that are interested in envisioning the future of medicine, whether they're doctors or hospital CEOs or, you know, people in the pharmaceutical industry or empowered patients, because, you know, part of what I'm doing, I'm bringing Charles Eisenstein to help me facilitate to create that field of infinite possibility so that the community itself, it's not going to be a group of people that are listening to, you know, talking heads on stage. We're really looking to have the wisdom of the community create the field and help us to re-envision the future of medicine. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for, you know, for being part of uh, today's news. Gabe, any, any thoughts on what Lisa just shared there before we wrap up for this week's news? Well, I mean, we're in total alignment. It's really about getting this community together and as many communities together as possible to come up with the answers. We know that no one person is going to think of it, but there's so many great heart centered doctors and practitioners in the world that want to see this change. And I think there hasn't been enough unifying um, opportunities. And so, you know, grateful to be a part of one with what we're doing and, and then grateful to learn about new ones and, and who, uh, you know, maybe we'll join all of them at some point on some level, we're all really connecting. So. Absolutely. Right. Our goal Lisa, here has just been to bring all these voices together. There's a grand convergence afoot and uh, the role that you're playing can't be uh, underestimated. Any final thoughts? Oh, you know, I, I just love what, the way you just said that. I, I have this vision of like little puddles all over the planet and all it's going to take is one big rain to converge those puddles into a great tidal wave of change. And I feel it. I feel it coming. And I think it really is about tuning into that frequency of love and remembering that that's why we do this. We do this out of love. We do this out of love for our profession, out of love for our patients, out of love for one another. And that frequency of, of unconditional love, of the healer's love, I think is more powerful than any of the forces that threaten to corrupt our system. So I find it really exciting. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Lisa Rankin, for being here on the Evolution of Medicine news video cast. I've been here with my partner, Gabe Hoffman, as well. It is the, the 14th of May. Um, if you're listening to this, make sure to check out tomorrow. Uh, we've got our uh, practice management post-conference for the IFM annual conference, where I am right now. And uh, if you'd like to find out more about uh, Lisa's programs, you can go to goevomed.com slash Rankin, R-A-N-K-I-N, and uh, you'll find out more about that the whole health medicine institute we definitely intend to be in uh, in san diego in october to be part of that conversation thanks so much for being here this is the evolution of medicine podcast and we'll see you next time <laughs>